The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, my name is Sam and I'm a new hire here at Metron and today I'm going to give a talk in the brown bag series of talks about some work I did before I came to Metron and I first want to begin by taking all of you for showing up and taking some time out of your busy day to join me uh, during your lunch or during your time before lunch as the case may be. So the topic of my talk is Obamacare and the Internal Revenue Service Fixed Point Iteration. Okay, so I'm going to begin with a little story background here about how I encountered this problem. So last year, I took a flight to the Midwest to visit a university friend at the University of Iowa. And when I got to the nearest airport, I found it was not so near the University of Iowa, and I found that all the taxis were out of business. So naturally, what did I do? I got on my phone, downloaded the Uber app, and took an Uber to travel from the airport to the University of Iowa. And it was a bit of a drive there from Cedar Rapids, and so I got to know my Uber driver a bit during the ride. Uh, he discussed some of the challenges of his work because being an Uber driver doesn't mean you're an employee of Uber at least not in most states that I've ever heard of. Uh, it's, it, it means that you're a kind of independent contractor or self-employed person who is using Uber as a way to connect yourself to clients. And when we started to talk, and I mentioned that I was a mathematician, he, he um, was curious to know whether I might help him compute uh, the quantities that appeared in his Obamacare benefits. And if I had a quarter for every person who thought that a mathematician and accountant were the same thing, <laughs> the IRS would be very interested in EDP. But uh, I decided, well, I don't think this is my line of work, but I will be happy to take a look. <clears throat> and so I got some different popular tax software, uh, like, for example, TurboTax, H&R Block, these sorts of things, and I just plugged in different values uh, for self-employed income into those and I found that occasionally, not often, but occasionally I would get Obamacare tax credits that seemed a little lower than I expected or in some cases zero, although I couldn't always tell if that was because of the law or, or because of an artifact of the tax software or what. So I decided maybe I will look a little bit more into this, see if there's anything more here, but I wasn't sure if there was really a problem at that point and I wasn't sure that what I was encountering, whether it was, I was unsure whether it was due to human error, you know, on the part of the Uber driver or myself, whether it was due to a glitch in tax software, whether it was due to something in the way IRS guidance is written that is interpreted by the tax software, whether it was something in the internal revenue code that was being interpreted by the IRS in writing guidance, or if it was just something in the law by Congress that was operating the way it was supposed to, and we just, the results were surprising. So it wasn't clear what st step along the journey between Congress and me and this Uber driver these results were coming across. So some detective work was required. And before I explain exactly what I found and exactly what happened, it might be helpful for you to review with me uh, what the Affordable Care Act, also called Obamacare, says, uh, because it's a pretty long and complicated act, and we won't touch on the whole thing, naturally. So back in 2010, Congress passed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which is now also called Obamacare. And one thing it did was that it increased funding for states that wanted to expand Medicaid. Medicaid is a health program for people with very low incomes. And it intended to expand this so to everyone who had incomes below 138% of the federal poverty. I don't know exactly where Congress came up with this number, um, but that's, that's basically the way it, it is to be interpreted. And it provided for reduced funding for any states that refused to expand Medicaid in this prescribed manner. However, in 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that this was, quote, coercive towards the states and violated states' rights 
the rights of the states to self-govern to a limited extent under the Constitution. So this part was struck down, and only the so you had a carrot and stick, so to speak, right? You took away the stick, you still have the carrot. That wasn't struck down by by uh, the Supreme Court. So that meant that states that expanded could still get the extra funding, but states that didn't expand would just carry on as before. And lo and behold, even today, many states uh, such as Florida and South Carolina, where I'm from, uh, do not have the Medicaid expansion. Although this is the first year that Virginia has expanded Medicaid, which was January. So that's all very interesting. Uh, another facet of the Affordable Care Act was that online exchanges were set up whereby any individual or household could directly purchase insurance through an exchange online. And so the health insurance companies, they offer their health insurance through this exchange. Also, and very importantly, everything that appears on this exchange has to meet certain minimum requirements. Uh, kind of like, uh, has to meet a kind of bill of rights for patients, so to speak, so that you won't think that you're going to have a child go to the hospital and find out, sorry, your health insurance won't cover the birth of your child, even if that's the only thing you wanted it for to that. You know, so there's certain basic things that have to be met uh, in order to appear on this exchange. And finally, or not really finally, because the act contains so many things I couldn't possibly include everything here, but finally for us, it includes a new tax <laughs> device, which is a special type of tax credit, which helps households with lower incomes to pay the insurance premiums of the insurance they buy on that exchange. Okay, and this is a pretty complicated and inventive tax device. It basically is paying most of the premiums for eligible households, except for what's called the expected contribution, which I will discuss in a more mathematical slide. Okay, but this is a rough outline of how these three things fit together, that the people with very low incomes would be eligible for Medicaid, people of the lower but not lowest incomes could qualify for a tax credit, and people of higher incomes presumably could get insurance through an employer or through the exchange. Anyway, that was the rough idea, I think. So now I want to zoom in a little bit on this tax device, because it plays an important role in our story. So how does it work? I'm going to kind of outline the steps of computing it because I need to talk to accountants sometimes. But after I show you the steps, I will then present a picture, which may be more helpful than any of the steps. Nevertheless, I'm going to show you the steps first. Okay, so the first step is that one needs to compute what's called household income, which is just what you would see on an ordinary 1040 American tax return. You compute all these things and get your total income from all sources. And then there's certain things called above the line deductions, which are deducted on the front page of the old tax form. And those things include things like uh, deductible IRA contributions, uh, things like student loan interest. And then you'd get from that the adjusted gross income. And that's what actually is what you're taxed on. So in this case, the definition of income is slightly different, so it's called modified adjusted gross income. Modified adjusted gross income, that. And the reason it's called that is because it includes tax-free income in that adjusted gross income that's used for this. That prevents somebody who's a billionaire and has invested all their money in, say, tax-free municipal bonds from taking advantage of Obamacare and getting <laughs> reduced cost health insurance. Because even if their income is all tax-free, it's still income for the purposes of this act. So it's truly benefiting people of lower incomes not just people who have low taxable income. Okay, so then you need to compute something called the federal poverty line, F. And the federal poverty line is interesting because most taxes in the United States depend on whether you're single or married and not too many other factors, right? I mean, there's all the income and the deductions, but in terms of your tax status, right? But the federal poverty line depends on your tax family size. So if you have many children, your federal poverty line is higher than if you are a single person. And it doesn't have to do with whether you're married or not. It only has to do with your household size. Who are your dependents? Who are you supporting? Okay, these people don't necessarily have to be related to you by blood. Okay, I won't get into too much of the technicalities, but uh, suffice to say that this is a very popular definition in Utah, where many households typically have seven people. 
um, partly due to having many children or grandchildren uh, staying with the primary breadwinners. So, roughly speaking, for your intuition, in the continental US, Hawaii and Alaska do things differently, and I won't really discuss them. Uh, the federal poverty line is roughly $8,000 plus $4,000 times the number of people. So if I'm a single person, my federal poverty line is $12,000. If I'm a person who's supporting, say, a wife and two children, my federal poverty line will be $24,000. Okay. Now, you compute the exact value of your modified adjusted gross income divided by the federal poverty line. This is the only place in the U.S. tax code where you can't round at all. You can't round to the nearest penny, can't round to the nearest dollar. It's an exact real number. Okay. <laughs> so you compute this number, and if it's greater than four, meaning you're more than four times in income than the federal poverty line, then you get no tax credit from Obamacare. Okay? That's pretty important. If I'm one dollar more than four times, I get nothing. But if I just make exactly four times, I get a quite substantial amount. So it's kind of curious. And it's the source of some difficulties if you're examining it from the viewpoint of continuity. Okay. So if you're greater than four, you get no benefit. But what if you're less than or equal to four times? Well, you have a benefit, so you want to calculate it. So in step four, you would plug this value, which is a real number, M, because we divide it, you know, exactly. And it's going to be in the interval from one to four. Why is it not going to be less than one? That's a very long story. It has to do with that Supreme Court ruling I mentioned earlier. Okay, basically, if you're below 100% of the federal poverty line, uh, you cannot get an Obamacare benefit, period, even if you're in a state which has no Medicaid expansion. So that's what we call the Medicaid gap in Washington. Okay, it has to do with nobody writing this seems to have foreseen the possibility that not only would uh, states not expand, but some states wouldn't even expand to 100% of the federal poverty line. So you could argue that this is an oversight of the people writing this, but it's hard to predict how your act will be mangled after it's passed. So maybe some uh, forgiveness is desirable, but it's pretty horrible that if you make 99% of the federal poverty line and you live in, say, Florida, you can get no assistance for getting health care. Anyway, uh, you're going from one to four, and then this function f, which is a governmentally defined function, which is different each year, uh, gives an output which is generally thought of as a percentage called the applicable figure. And that is the percentage of your income that you're expected to be able to afford to pay for your health insurance costs. Again, I don't know where these numbers come from. They're generated by the government every year, uh, but there's a function. And it's always one-sided continuous, and it's always non-decreasing. So that means that people with more income are paying a larger percentage, or they're able to afford a larger percentage of their income uh, to pay for health care according to the government. Okay, so this is the output from that. And you can think of this as a black box for our purposes, although it is nice to know that it is not decreasing as one-sided continuous by the grade of Congress. So this, you then take this number, which might be five hundredths, for example, and multiply it by your modified income, and that's called your expected contribution. So you're taking your income, multiplying by a certain percentage, and you get a certain number, and that's how many dollars the government expects you to be able to contribute for your health care. So if you're making, say, 100% of the federal poverty line, it might be 2% of your income. If you're making, say, four times the federal poverty line, it might be as high as 9.5%. Those tend to be where it settles each year, although it goes both up and down from year to year. There's no rhyme or reason that I know of as to why the numbers are exactly the way they are. But I'm sure someone knows, just not me. Okay, so that's the idea there. And when you have your expected contribution, you're doing quite well. You're almost done with this, uh, this, this uh, lengthy procedure. The next thing you need is you need to actually take into account the cost of health insurance because your benefits have to do with health insurance. And all this time, you haven't been doing anything with health insurance yet. You've just been calculating incomes and numbers and percentages and whatnot. So at this point, you need what's called the sticker price of the health insurance premium, which is just the unsubsidized cost per month times 12 to get the whole year. 
okay? And I do mean unsubsidized. It, you may not actually see the sticker price when you go online, because it may say cost to you might be that the program is subtracting something that the government pays that they may or may not reveal to you, and then say, here's what you pay, but the sticker price might be much higher. So it, it's good to keep that in mind. But anyway, this is uh, given out in tax forms every year, whether you like it or not. So if you are actually on Obamacare, you would know what this is, at least from a tax form. Then we have the following issue, that the government can't be in the business of telling you what health insurance to buy. Or at least it may tell you that it wants you to buy health insurance, but it won't tell you which plan to buy. And so there needs to be some device for setting how much the government will pay that's not based on what you actually pay. Okay, a little tricky. So what the authors of the Affordable Care Act decided to do is to create a benchmark health insurance and pay you money based on the cost of the benchmark health insurance. So what they chose is when you go on the exchange, there's a bunch of different plans offered in each county. And apparently the second lowest cost silver plan is the plan used for benchmarking purposes. If there's only one, then you pick that one. If there's three, you pick the second one. If there's no silver ones, I don't know what you do. <laughs> this is not considered by the Affordable Care Act. But <laughs> anyway, let's assume there's at least one silver plan. So then that would be the benchmark health insurance. And it depends on your county of residence. So every county has going to have different numbers. It depends on your age. Health insurance is more expensive for older people because of the higher probability that they will need health care. It will depend on your smoking habits in states that permit that. It will also depend on the tax year because every year the health insurance company may offer a different rate. So I can't just present one table that will have every possible value because I don't not really familiar with every county in the United States. And some of them, some states use their own exchanges. And finally, usually the premium tax credit is just the amount that goes here. If you add up your expected contribution plus the premium tax credit, it should equal normally the cost of the benchmark insurance, which may or may not be the insurance you actually bought. Okay, but anyway, it at least makes that particular insurance affordable if this amount is affordable and you get this amount of money. So that's that. And you can solve for the premium tax credit as just the benchmark cost minus your inspected contribution. Uh, however, uh, in case this is negative, they don't want to have any negatives involved. So they max between this and zero. Also, they don't want to pay you more than what you actually paid if you bought a really cheap insurance plan. So they take the minimum of that with what you actually pay. Okay, they're not going to, if you buy an plan and it's $200 a month and you get $300 a month, then you're kind of profiting off of the federal government, which uh, happens, but it is, they try to reduce that to a reasonable extent. So anyway, that, that's what happens here in computing the premium tax credit. And just as a quick reminder, your expected contribution is just your income times the output of this kind of black box function. That was on the previous slide. Okay, now this is all kind of accounting work that I've you know, jazzed up by writing with mathematical symbols. But is any of this of interest to a mathematician? Probably not. Why? Because there's no mathematical problem for a mathematician here, right? You had all these inputs, you produce the output according to some functions. What's left to do, right, from a mathematician's point of view? But before I answer that burning question, <laughs> let me mention, this is a little picture I made in MATLAB just uh, this morning uh, that uh, is an example of what the premium tax credit looks like as a function of household income if I fix all the other parameters, okay? So here I've assumed it's a household of one person for simplicity. I've assumed that the sticker price is $500 per month, just have a nice round number, okay? And I've pretended that the Medicaid gap doesn't exist just to avoid weird stuff on the left side. So you see at the beginning, if someone has zero income, they would be getting all of their health insurance paid for by the government in this non-existent scenario where I 
there's no Medicaid and the thing works all the time. And then as your income increases as a percentage of the federal poverty line to 200%, 300%, 400%, the uh, tax credit dollars per month decrease. And then at 400%, it drops to zero. Okay, you'll notice there's another discontinuity here. Right? Somewhere between 100 and 150, there's another discontinuity. That has to do with the Supreme Court ruling. That's below or on 138% of the federal poverty line. There are provisions in the Affordable Care Act that work below 138%, but they were written uh, with certain types of immigrants in mind, and they're not continuous with the rest of the Affordable Care Act. So they make sense logically, um, and they define the function there, but there's a discontinuity around 138% of the line. So that's a cute graph. You'll notice these things aren't all linear. There's actually some convexity, right? There's a kind of bulge outward in this. It's not quite a straight line, although this is a straight line, right? So uh, it's not something that's piecewise linear, but you could say it's piecewise polynomial with very small curvature if you wanted to be you know, very geometric about it. But this is the picture you should have in mind. Okay, so now I can compute the premium tax credit as I described using the eight, st eight, st eight steps or my chart, my program. Uh, but what about the Uber driver? He's not an employee, he's self employed. He receives a 1099 from Uber, not a W 2. Okay, independent contractor like a tutor or taxi driver. So, how does that change things for him? Well, it changes things in the following way. One of those above the line deductions, like the student loan interest deduction and the deductible IRA deduction, is specifically for self employed people and it asks them to deduct their out of pocket cost for health insurance premiums. Okay, kind of like a business expense. Right? You're the employer and the employee wearing two hats. So if I'm now going to imagine a kind of simplified scenario, right? Just imagine your only source of income is some kind of self-employed income, and I've subtracted off any employer expenses, okay? That might include the employer half of Social Security and Medicare. Every, every time you get a paycheck, part is deducted for Social Security and Medicare, but your employer is also paying some that as well, okay? So if I call that I for the earned income, and then if D represents this self-employed health insurance deduction, then I get the usual formula, your modified adjusted gross income M is equal to I minus D again. And from this M, one can compute the premium tax credit. So it still seems like there's no real issue with computing this for the Uber driver. But what is that number D? I is for sure known to the Uber driver as his income. What is that D? What is the out of pocket cost of the health insurance premiums. So if you think about out-of-pocket cost, isn't necessarily the sticker price P, especially if the premium tax credit is greater than zero, because the out-of-pocket cost OOP, did I make up OOP? <coughs> okay, OOP does not include the portion of the premiums paid by the government. The out-of-pocket cost should be what you pay, not what you and the government paid together. So really, your value of D should be your out-of-pocket cost, which should be the sticker price minus what the government is paying. But consider what the government is paying actually depends on your D. Because we can look back in our formula from before and replace M with I minus D and see that D shows up here as the input for the premium tax credit. That's a little mathematical archaeology, right? Unsubstituting. So we see that in trying to commute D, we need the out-of-pocket cost. From the out-of-pocket cost, we need the premium tax credit. But to find the premium tax credit, we need D, which is what we first were trying to find. And so the earlier portions of my Uber driver's tax return depended on the later portions of the tax return, which is the reverse. Usually the earlier stuff is used to compute the later stuff. In fact, uh, that's one of the main criteria used in deciding how to write the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, so we have a circular relationship in the tax code where you need the answers to compute the answers. <laughs> okay. 
this is um, this is mathematically interesting, or at least more interesting than anything you've seen so far. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't supposed to be any circular relationships in our tax code. I'm not sure of any other countries I know of like this. So it's time to hunt into the internal revenue code to see if there's any help because the law is done telling us what to do <laughs> and we don't have an answer yet okay so i moved from the law written by congress to the internal revenue code which is supposed to just be interpretation of the law okay or almost no interpretation at all so the internal revenue code doesn't say what to do here because it's really just a reflection of the law however it does have certain constraints you can't just put in a deduction of five million dollars because there was some you know ambiguity or something. There are constraints on what you can put in, even if the law doesn't tell you exactly how to compute things. So one rule or meta rule present in the Internal Revenue Code, which is of interest here, is called the no double dipping rule. And what does that say? This is again my paraphrasing of a meta rule. So you won't find this stated exactly this way, but this is materially present. And it says that each dollar spent on health insurance sticker prices can lead to a dollar of deduction or a dollar of tax credit, but not to both. And if you think about it, that makes sense. You should not have a negative cost of health insurance because you got a dollar back for the dollar you paid and then got maybe 20 cents or 30 cents by deducting it from your tax, tax income. And so if we turn this into an inequality, it says that the premium tax credit plus the amount we actually deduct, D, which I'm still not sure about, is less than or equal to the sticker price. Okay, that prevents double dipping. And so if we just put D equal to P, like we would for an employee, and PTC was positive, then this would violate the inequality. So we can't just deduct the sticker price. We should only deduct the out-of-pocket cost, which we don't know. So the best case scenario at this point, knowing what we know, is that we can divide the sticker price into two pieces, one being the premium tax credit, which the government pays for, the other being a deduction, which we don't know, but that at least gives us some tax benefit, even if it's not paid for by the government, because we're self-employed. Ideally, also, the value taken for premium tax credit would be the one that comes from the deduction we chose. That would be consistent with the Affordable Care Act. Well, we have two equations and two unknowns, right? Equation number one, equation number two, unknown D, unknown PTC. We could try to solve the two equations and two, two unknowns, couldn't we? Wouldn't that solve our problem? That doesn't sound very mathematically interesting. But it is a mathematical problem, however trivial. <laughs> so the IRS took great interest in these two equations and decided to create an iterative fixed point procedure uh, to solve for PTC and D based on these two equations. Okay, you see, if you try to solve two equations and two unknowns that involve nonlinearities, it might require that you actually understand algebra, right? However, to do your taxes, algebra is not a requirement. <laughs> An IRS guidance has to be written, which does not require that you use algebra. That's why the instructions are so long. To doing all the arithmetic that would do the algebra when you have really complicated taxes. Okay, so in 2014, Arvind Ravishandran, the uh, tax attorney at the IRS, uh, at the time wrote uh, Revenue Proceeding 2014-41, an infamous document. <laughs> The IRS asked taxpayers to use those two desired equations to define a fixed point iteration, starting from guesses chosen by the IRS, which tend to favor the IRS as an initial condition, uh, by which suitable values for the premium tax credit and deduction deed were to be determined. And I'm now going to describe the fixed point iteration. So you begin by taking a guess that your premium tax credit is zero. That's very suspicious, <laughs> okay? But that's the guess you're required to make. And then you would guess that your deduction is just the sticker price, which would be consistent if the premium tax credit were in fact zero. And then you set PTC1 and D1 to be the initial guess for the premium tax credit and deduction. 
So now we have our initial condition for our fixed point iteration. Then we get the, if we have the nth point in the iteration, the new point is defined as basically plugging in the previous values into the right sides of the two equations above. So the new guess for the premium tax credit is just plugging in the old deduction into the formula. And the new guess for the deduction is just when you take when you take the sticker price and subtract off the premium tax credit guess you just computed. Okay. So that's defines a fixed point iteration. And if the limit of these two sequences is, as in goes to infinity exists in the IRS sense, then we may set the premium tax credit to be the limiting value of the first sequence and the deduction to be the limiting value of the second sequence. And in this case, it can be shown that the two equations are satisfied by these limiting values when the limits exist. And to the nearest dollar, the problem is solved. What is convergence in the IRS sense? The IRS has to devote quite a lot of material to this in document 2014-41. The IRS writers don't seem to be aware that they are reinventing something called the Cauchy criterion of mathematical analysis. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, they are. <laughs> and essentially, the condition is that uh, after a certain point in the sequence, all the points beyond that point are within, let's see, one dollar of that value. Okay, so it's basically the Cauchy criterion with epsilon equal to one dollar. And that's why the IRS says don't do any rounding in the intermediate steps, because you need to look at quantities smaller than a dollar in order to evaluate whether your absolute value is less than a dollar. So when you have convergence in the IRS sense, which is the Cauchy criterion with epsilon equal to one dollar, then you have these limiting values and the problem is solved. But this does raise a question, doesn't it? Do the two limits always exist? If the limit doesn't exist, what's the good of all this stuff? So uh, this is a little, this is a very old MATLAB experiment I did a long time ago. Uh, it wasn't necessarily programmed perfectly, but it gives you the flavor of this thing. Okay. Basically, everywhere you see in black is an uh, area where I have IRS convergence, and I just plug in some values into this. Okay. So you see we have good IRS convergence most of the time here, all right? But there's also these places in red, you'll see a little tiny smidge up there and a smidge here. Those places in red, I've plotted the limb inf and the limb sup of the relevant sequences. So basically when I look at the sequence and it diverges, I look at the smallest place where the values are clustering together and the largest place where the values are clustering together and I'll plot both of them in red. Since it converges, there's no single limiting value that I can plot. Okay, so that's what you see here and here and there and there. And this is kind of a mistake. You can ignore that. Okay, it's supposed to be zero here, but this is not supposed to be zero. But the blue is stuff that I filled in, so it doesn't come from the IRS. Question? Yeah, um, on my right hand side, the, um, the last sort of discontinuity, the red is above the black curve. Is yep. that part of the plotting, or is that real? No, the limb soup is too high to be a plausible value. It continually overshoots, because what happens is you, you take a deduction that's suddenly um, very big, because your tax rate is suddenly very low, because your income is high, right? And that big deduction causes you to have a really low income, which causes you to have a really big tax credit, which causes that overshoot. Then you repeat it and you get a tax credit of zero again in the next iteration, right? You're down here again. But now that leads to a really big tax credit in the next iteration and you overshoot and so on. So that's why that red is so high there. Is that a constant offset or is that a scale? Uh, sorry, what is your question? Factor or an additive factor? So I'm, I'm not finding exact mathematical formulas here. I'm just running a MATLAB program. So I only see what I see and don't know more than you about the mathematical laws governing these, these particular lines. So this is very problematic. And I just filled in kind of a, a, a sort of 
my guesses for what things maybe should be in blue, but at this stage, I didn't necessarily know what the appropriate fix for this was. This is me I did quite a long time ago when I was first investigating this. And just to zoom in a little bit uh, near, near the Supreme Court discontinuity. So here, it still overshoots a little bit on the above one, although it overshoots very small. But here, the undershoot, if that's even a word, it is uh, pretty low there. And the discontinuity is actually at 133% of the federal poverty line here, but things are shifted to the right because my definition of income for this particular plot is before I do the above the line self-employed health insurance deduction. That's why it's a little on the high side for this particular plot and similarly with the next one. But you can see that there are people who would normally receive quite ordinary, uncontroversial amounts for their Obamacare credit, who may be getting this amount, because the IRS asks you to give the limb inch if it diverges, although it does so in a very oblique way that wouldn't possibly make you think of limb inch when they say it. <laughs> okay. And here's a zoom in at the uh, subsidy clip discontinuity, which would be normally near 400% of the federal poverty line. And basically, all these people are getting zero, even the people up there who would normally receive their full subsidy amount. So that's troubling. Let's see. So, oops, did I already do this? Okay. So there might be an error in my slides where I've repeated this. I hope. There we go. This is my proposed solution. Basically, these two equations might be inconsistent because they could violate the no double dipping, basically, due to the discontinuity and the benefits. In this case, the taxpayer receives it most of them in. And so I initially proposed an alternative procedure, which I won't go through in detail, which generated those blue lines you saw earlier, which basically is numerically solving a constrained tax benefit optimization problem. Okay. So basically, I'm maximizing the tax benefit, which is the benefit from the premium tax credit and the benefit from the deduction, based on the constraints that the no double dipping rule hold the premium tax credit be less than equal to the value that's computed by the deduction, and the deduction not exceed the sticker price. And I won't tell you exactly how I did that and what happened, because uh, tax attorneys said that this was not suitable because the premium tax credit had to be exactly equal to the output of the Obamacare calculations prescribed by the Affordable Care Act. And it could not be some lesser amount. So basically, it's so rigid, I couldn't optimize with respect to two variables, but only one variable, the deduction. This says lesser amount at the bottom. Sorry about cut off. So. That was bad because it meant that my first solution wasn't going to work, but it was good in that it reduced a two variable problem to a one variable problem, which is much easier to explain in a presentation. <laughs> Sorry, Sam, uh, on the previous slide, yes. uh, so they didn't like this strategy because the uh, value wouldn't be exactly what PTC suggested it should be, right? Yes, so this allows PTC to be strictly less than right. the value coming from this deduction D. Is that not true with their technique, with the limit that you described? So I didn't say what PTC the person actually received in the first bullet. I just said they receive at most the limb inf of the sequence. In fact, what actually happens in practice is they get a deduction, which is particularly low, and then they compute the premium tax credit based on that deduction. And that result is less than or equal to the limit of this sequence. So the IRS guidance that exists now is actually in compliance with the PTC equaling the value you get from the deduction D, but that wasn't obvious to me at the time I did this. <coughs> I was just kind of turning out an algorithm into a computer program and seeing what might fill in the blank spaces? Great question. So now it's a one variable problem depending on the deduction D. 
and the premium tax credit is exactly the one computed in D. So this is what my constraints turn into, and this is my tax benefit. Now, because PTC is an increasing function of D, if I deduct more, my income is lower, I get a bigger benefit, right? True? So it's monotone increasing, and D is a monotone increasing function of D also. As D gets bigger, D gets bigger. Nobody's going to argue with that. So this thing is at a maximum when D is at a maximum. So the problem is very simple now. We just want to maximize D subject to this constraint, right? And this thing is an increasing function of D. So we just have this function, PTC of D plus D, that's going up. And we just want to find the rightmost point where it's less than or equal to P, the biggest value of D where it's less than or equal to P. But that's a very simple mathematical problem now. Certainly, all possible values of D could be tried by a computer program. And the largest for which this inequality is true would yield the greatest tax benefit. And so I submitted this as my second solution to the IRS. What was the problem with this one? IRS guidance only admits procedures which can be done by hand in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> I don't know how they define reasonable because sometimes it doesn't take a long time. <laughs> I found this to be somewhat frustrating. And I considered, you know, the existing procedures, they say, and I'll quote this, they say, if you are unable to complete the verification step because changes between steps are always $1 or more, this is with the Cauchy criteria with epsilon equal to $1 and 0 cents, if it never occurs that they are always less than $1, do not use this procedure. <laughs> Although they offer no alternative. <laughs> this is very curious because they require everything to be done in a reasonable amount of time, yet to know that this thing never occurs requires an infinite amount of time. <laughs> so I have no idea how they define reason. But anyway, I consider the problem to be mathematically solved at this point because the solution was, was guaranteed to exist and could be handled by a computer program. But the IRS was not happy, so I proceeded to go back to my calculus lessons and review how you might compute a thing in this very simple case of an increasing function. Okay, so I'll take just a minute to review this before I conclude my presentation. So if you ever saw a proof of the intermediate value theorem in college, um, this will make sense. Otherwise, this may not be followable. So you can just like get out a book and read for a minute or two till I get a couple slides down. Okay, so basically, the kind of scenario that appears in the intermediate value theorem is you have two values of a function, a low value and a high value, and you want to find an x value that you plug in to get an intermediate value. It's the name of the theorem. So one way to find that intermediate value is to guess or try out the midpoint of that interval, plug it into the function. If it's exactly equal to that value, you are done, right? If it's smaller than the value you seek, you look at the right half of the interval because you know it's too small on the left, too big on the right, probably somewhere in the middle of that right half, you get what you want. And if it's too big, you look in the left half of that interval. And now your search space has been halved compared to where you started with. So even though you haven't solved the problem, you've made a lot of progress, you know, half the space probably doesn't have what you see. And then you just repeat that infinitely many times because you're a mathematician and you can say things like that, right? Until eventually, uh, you can argue that only one point lies in this infinite sequence of intervals you picked. And then you can argue that the sequence of midpoints you picked converges to that in the limit. And finally, this is very important for our case because we want to prove that what we do works. You can prove that f of that value c actually gives the desired value. Because you can sneak up on it from the right-hand endpoints and get that the limit of the function values is bigger than or equal to the value you see. Because all the right-hand endpoints had f of that thing too big. And then you can sneak up it from the left endpoints and take a limit and use the continuity of the function to argue that f of that c is less than or equal to the value you see. And since it's not bigger and not smaller, it must be equal to. And so that proves that this simple bisection algorithm of having the interval works all the time. So for the IRS guidance, I do the same interval having trick. Okay. 
And it's easier because I'm not proving equality, just inequality. So I have the interval from zero to the sticker price, and I'm seeking the deduction D. And I define my function to be the one where I wanted to satisfy that constraint, the premium tax credit plus the deduction is less than or equal to the sticker price. So the problem is trivial if this inequality is not true. And in the non-trivial case, you have that G of zero is less than or equal to P, and P is less than G of P. That is, if you deducted the whole sticker price and got a tax benefit after that, it would violate the no double labor rule, right? So G of P would be greater than P. So in this non-trivial case, you just guess the midpoint and plug it into your function that you want to be less than equal to P. If it's less than equal to P, you're happy with the left endpoint and you reduce your search space to the right half of the interval. Because now the left half, the left endpoint of the new interval is a good point. It's an equal, it satisfies the no double digit rule. Now, if G of D1 is greater than P, you know that already in the midpoint, you're violating the no double digit rule. Because it's an increasing function, you eliminate all the right half of your search space. So you just look at the left end the left half of the interval, and now you keep repeating the intervals, and eventually, when you half, 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 there's gonna be one point that lies in all these intervals. I'll just denote it by D infinity, and again, by the grace of Congress, the premium tax credit has one-sided continuity, and it happens to be continuous on the appropriate side to prove that G of D infinity is less than or equal to P. So, somehow, Although we have a very complicated law, uh, Congress has been kind enough to us that we can actually prove that the solution to this natural algorithm is solving the problem. So that was pretty cool. So basically you sneak up on it from the uh, endpoints where G of dn is less than or equal to p and take the limit with the one-sided continuity to get G of d infinity less than or equal to p. And by monotonicity, you know that any larger value of that deduction D is going to violate the no double living rule. So you know for sure and have proven that you have optimized the tax benefit of the person. That anything larger is not allowed, and what you have is legal. So it's perfect. And you implying this by section procedure, our Uber driver found an appropriate value of his deduction D and was able to get a significantly larger value for his premium tax credit than that offered by any IRS guidance or tax software. So he got his check for, I forget, he didn't tell me exactly, but it sounded like a couple thousand dollars because it was accumulated from the whole 12 months, right? $200 a month, 12 months, you're quickly at a couple thousand dollars. So he was very happy to have that check come in from the treasury shortly thereafter. And so I considered that my client was happy with the result. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the bulk of my presentation. And here are some of my favorite references. Um, so although internal revenue proceeding 2014-41 exists online, it's not particularly user-friendly in my opinion. So in the intervening four years or five years, the IRS has come out with publication 974. And I've just selected a few pages from it. It only takes like 20 or 30 pages to see how they give you exact instructions for performing their fixed point iteration. So this is the more user-friendly version. I wouldn't call it user-friendly, but it's less user-unfriendly than Revenue Proceeding 2014-41. And uh, this is a little story that appeared in Money Magazine, uh, and it includes a little three-minute video where I discuss a little bit of what I've talked to you about today. And this is a little preprint from me uh, where I outline what I've talked to you here in this presentation on the archive. And thank you very much for coming and attending my talk. And if you have any suggestions or questions, I, that's an old email address. You should probably email me at my, my Electron email address, <laughs> which luckily all of you know. Thank you. Question? Yes. So uh, is, is, uh, is the strategy that you came up with uh, usable by, I say, uh, some of the tax software online that people can? Tax software can use it, but uh, they've been able to solve this problem for years and years and have said so. But they won't implement any solution because their legal teams tend to frown upon anything not explicitly introduced by IRS guidance. Yeah. So they've been able to solve this for many years, but have chosen not to do so. So is there any hope that the 
thing that you came up with will be available to the common man say yes so uh i'm not sure exactly how soon but uh when when my paper is published the IRS has said that they will look into turning it into guidance in their format based on the paper, according to the, was it the chief counsel office that I talked to on the phone. And then uh, once it's turned into IRS guidance, then the tax software people will be willing to implement it. Okay. In the meantime, anybody who wants to make tax software that implements it is welcome to do so. Uh, it's, it's explained in my archive, although I don't know how many people uh, have a joint interest in mathematics and you know, tax software generation. <laughs> but I had the option of patenting it, but I just didn't see that it was, uh, you know, something I wanted to patent. <laughs> you know, like all this paperwork and time and expense, but do I really want to enforce that patent? You know, like, does it matter? Like, it's not really, I mean, it's targeted at low income people. There's not a whole lot, anyway. So <laughs> I, I, I decided not to pursue the, you know, uh, profit motive in this case. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, and also, I, I created a website with a Google engineer that basically gives some uh, rough outputs for what things should be uh, based on rough inputs for what you have. So people have been using that to ballpark uh, their values and see, am I possibly in one of those intervals where I'm being screwed over? Uh, or not. Uh, people have been using that website uh, for probably a year and a half, maybe a little more, and that's how the Money Magazine person found me. Yeah, it's just through my NYU website, and it's very bare bones, and it's not necessarily perfect, but it's, uh, it, was, it was helpful to many people last year, and I, I received a lot of requests from uh, accountants to update it uh, for the 2019 tax year, so that may be forthcoming. <laughs> Yes. Have you um, noticed anything else illogical in government that you're taking on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, every time I, I uh, go to Washington, but uh, no, no, I, I, uh, I uh, there are other things I've looked into, but none that has yielded something uh, so interesting and practical as this. Yes. Was it easy to get the ear of the IRS for this issue? I mean, did you have to call them often to talk to someone? I only called them on the phone they answered so the trick is knowing what number to call it's easy to reach them but do you have the right phone number so i actually um had to do a lot of detective work to find what phone number to call it was not easy but once i had it things were easy from there basically i talked to congressional candidates in my home state of south carolina and one of them was able to procure the phone number for me that's the short story. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I called them up and uh, I talked to some people who were not familiar with what I was talking about, but shortly I was able to find someone who did know what I was talking about. And they, I said, are you aware of this issue? They said, yep, we're aware of this issue. And we didn't talk about it in revenue posting 2014-41, H but we know that the sequence doesn't always converge. I'm like, great, I'm so glad you know that there's a problem with this. Um, and I said, so why haven't you implemented a solution? And they said, well, the guy who wrote this, Arvind Ravishandran, as soon as he wrote it, shortly thereafter, he left for a, um, a big uh, law firm in New York City and left the IRS. And he was the one who understood fixed point iterations, or at least he thought he did, enough to write the person. <laughs> so uh, without that fellow there, uh, they didn't have a guy to write a solution to that. And they did, the people who were still there didn't know how to solve the issue so they just left it unsolved and they said yeah we're glad you solved it because we haven't <laughs> yeah great question yes is there any estimate of how many people this actually affects percentage of the population I, it's a very small percentage of the population because you have to have three conditions met for someone to be uh adversely affected first of all they have to be self-employed that means that takes away a lot of the population okay probably at most like and most 10% of workers are typically self-employed for their main source of income, right? There's obviously people who do side hustles, but they get health insurance from work. Okay. And then of those people, how many are Obamacare beneficiaries? I don't know, because a lot of them, just starting out, are very low income. They're on Medicaid, right? And a lot of them that are super successful, like uh, somehow, oh, 
I'm going to finish up in just a minute or two, but it's almost one o'clock. Uh, people who are very successful, like there are software engineers who do little uh, contracting work or, or consultants, you know, they're making big incomes, right? So somewhere in the middle, there's a lot of people. Um, but then you look at that subset, and for the majority, the existing fixed point duration is, is converging, right? So you're looking at uh, a relatively small percentage of the population that are self-employed beneficiaries of Obamacare, and they're in one of those two intervals where things diverge. It's hard to estimate because every county, the intervals are of a different width, right? So it's pretty tricky to get an accurate estimate. The order of magnitude, I can figure out the order of magnitude, it's roughly 100,000 households in the whole country, if you look at all 50 states, right? But whether that means 200,000 or just 50,000, I don't know, right? It, it's very, very hard. These things are very private. The IRS didn't tell me that, you know, I don't know. But, but that would be my order of magnitude. Yes, back of the envelope is roughly 100,000 uh, people. And if that's households, you know, that could be more people that are indirectly adversely affected by means of their spouse or co parent or child. Or uh, but that's just my very rough estimate, and that could be, you know, off by a factor of two or four. Yep. But I've certainly heard of people that benefit, they email me and say, This is cool. I got a check from the Treasury because I did this and that. You're awesome. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> any other questions? I believe it's about time to wrap up, but I time for one more question if anybody has anything. Okay, well, thank you again for coming, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day.